but it's really, very, really nice to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not a, I'm like, I suppose a lot of people preface this, I'm not a real book historian. Um, I thought what I've just done is I've, my department has been doing book history, I'll maybe just pass those around, since 1992, uh, the English department at the Open University. And I just, we've got one of our big projects is called the Reading Experience Database. Um, and I've just printed out, I've got a, copies of what our department do. Um, and really my interest in book history is largely, I suppose, because of my proximity to my colleagues and getting drawn into it more and more. Um, and I think also really just an es part of an escape from the studying of English literature. Uh, the studying of English literature involved close attention to the literary text in a formalist way. And part of the liberation was to locate that text in its historical context and part of that historical context is about its publishing history how, it, how you know the book as an artifact is part of the context of how you make sense of a literary work um, so okay you, that's the thing um, I remember listening to Archie introduce me I kind of you realize you're getting older and you, these things have happened in your life and one of the things that used to really annoy me and still do is when people who are over 50 lean back and tell other people in the profession how to do their jobs. You know, they say, oh, this is what you've got to do, there's all this work to be done, all this research. And I'm, I'm going to do a bit of that now, so I'm going to hold it up. Um, so you're so, so, I am, and I, I feel terrible starting off like this, but uh, I, I, I want to just think briefly, I mean, Beth and Archie have heard a version of, a 20 minute version of this paper before, and I've put in two big chunks take it up to about 45 minutes. Um, and this is the first new chunk. And I, I suppose it's really for all of us to wrestle with this, and I don't think it's an answer. I don't really have an answer, but I was trying to think about what we think the discipline of book history is, um, and what it's doing, and how a new discipline elbows its way into existence and competes with other, with other disciplines, and what language we use to, to talk about that. And I thought, I tried to look for, I, took, I spent a really long time trying to find a good paragraph by somebody that would lead me into that. And I've ended up with one by um, Isabel Hoffmeyer, who's, I think, the most, you know, you know, is a very old friend of mine and also somebody whose work I've admired enormously and who has been the kind of, I suppose, somebody I've read with great interest and respect for many years. But I thought I'd just look, and she says this is what book history is at the end of her chapter in this new collection by Andrew van der but I thought I'd treat it to a bit of close reading and look at the metaphors and the language of how we talk about what we do and just think about if we aren't all collectively caught within certain ways of thinking about it, and I'm going to then tell you what I think we should do instead. So okay, this is what um, Isabel says at the end of her chapter. She says. The field of book history as a distinct enterprise has only recently started to take root in South Africa. As such, it is necessarily a late entrant into a field that has elsewhere been taking shape for several decades. Can you, you can't see that, yeah. And then she says the next bit a bit further along, she says, book history in South Africa is necessarily in its infancy, and such work as does exist is largely national in orientation. And then right at the end, South Africa consequently faces two challenges it needs to live up to its name to become book history, an emphasis on the historical, and it also needs to develop a stronger transnational awareness so that the work done in South Africa can demonstrate its importance to scholarship elsewhere. Now, if you, if you look at this and you think about now, there are three different metaphors that are invoked there to try and describe how the new discipline of book history is coming into the world. And I want to take each of them in turn and think about what they mean and how they define how we think about what we do and where we might be going. Um, and as I say, all of these judgments appear uncontroversial, and they are. They're powerful metaphors, and they, they work, and they've become naturalized, and they make sense of how we think about what we're doing. But I want to flog them to death and see if there are any potential uh, ways we want to, you know, maybe question them. So the first metaphor is of the field. The field of book history as a distinct enterprise has started to take root. Um, so let's extrapolate. We're thinking of book history as a field and they're plants that have to be cultivated and extrapolate a little. South African book history is an untold, uncultivated field. South African book historians are enterprising farmers who will plant crops that will ultimately take root and grow. South African book history research is a crop, is, 
is the crop or the published research outputs that will eventually cover the field. So if you like, you plant a whole lot of potatoes, those are a whole lot of articles that will then cover the field, and then you will have a full field, and that will be what book history is. So that if South African book historians are good farmers, they will apply their skill and labor in enterprising ways and produce a rich crop of new research. Their field will grow to be the equal and of other adjacent fields like those of history and literary studies. So if you're thinking as farmers, as fields, as agriculturalists, that's, what, that's how we're thinking of what we're doing. That's one metaphor that's been mobilized. A second metaphor is of a race or a competition. That's the one that goes, as such, it is necessarily a late entrant into a field that has elsewhere been taking shape for several decades. And let's, as I say, let's just extrapolate that as well. With book history here, it is, a, yeah, it is of a race or competition with book history, South African book history, a late entrant to the field of international book history. In this case, the field is not one of potatoes, but of competing athletes. And South Africa has arrived rather late and will be obliged to catch up with the other entrants. The new discipline of South African book history has therefore to compete against other national book histories from around the world, with the earlier and more experienced entrants like France, the USA, and Britain at a distinct advantage. So we're like this slightly rubbish athlete that is, oh my god, I forgot my kids, I'm here late. We're now going to catch up with the French and the Americans who are way ahead of us because they've got better swimming pools and better coaching. That's the second metaphor. So it's a, it's a race, an international competition that we're trying to catch up. The third metaphor is the one that goes, book history in South Africa is necessarily in its infancy. Um, now, this is thinking, what are we thinking about book history? We're thinking, of, uh, uh, I, I think this, this precipitates a metaphor of an infant taking its first uncertain steps towards maturity, but at this early stage still contained within its parochial national boundaries. So the like, South African book history is like the protagonist in a building Um It's like a young man of modern or modest origins from the provinces who will travel through life, overcome obstacles along the way, and journey from the Plotteland to the city where he will reach adulthood and maturity and achieve recognition and self-knowledge. That's what happens in a building Stroman. And that's what's going to happen to South African book history. It's in its infancy, but it's going to grow and develop. It will overcome obstacles, it will travel, and then ultimately it will receive, it, it will achieve adulthood. The metaphor of South African book history as the protagonist of a building's roman suggests that South African book history is destined to develop from an infancy in the seminar halls and research journals of South African universities to an adolescence in the specialist book history journals in Britain and Europe, and ultimately in adulthood in international conferences and the prestigious Ivy League journals of the world's only superpower. I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm filling in and imagining how it's all going to, all how we're going to reach maturity, how this room of us, of six or seven of us, ten of us, is going to, how, how what we're doing is going to grow. If we, as I say, if we internalize and take these metaphors seriously. Now, and I think they, they're powerful and they work, and they, that's how we do think about what we're doing a lot of the time. But I want to say that you know, my, my, my opening point, really, my first point is that uh, they're very plausible, they're very powerful, they've become naturalized, and it's very hard to think of the rise of South African book histories in ways that contradict these mutually reinforcing me metaphorical tropes. Now, you know there's going to be a however. <clears throat> um, but what, I think what they lack in any of these three is that the production of knowledge, which is what we all do, we all paid salaries by, you know, by people's taxes, ultimately, we, you know, knowledge, research knowledge produced, we're producing knowledge as employees of state-funded universities. What we're doing has a political dimension. And as I say, I think that's left out in these three metaphors. And very crudely, um, you know, you could say there is knowledge that serves power, knowledge that silently colludes with power, and knowledge that's produced as research that critiques power. And I suppose for me the question must always be is where we locate South African book history within this range of alternatives. I'm saying there's a politics to our research always and everywhere, even if it's not explicit. Um, and I think, as I say, that this question is more important than cultivating a productive field of book history research. It's more important than producing research that competes successfully with international competitors. And it's more important than accelerating our infant discipline's journey through life from provincial backwaters to metropolitan adulthood. Um, for South African, and the, the last bit of um, the quote from Isabel is, you know, she says it needs to, she talks about it being consigned, I haven't actually put it on the screen there, that it'll end up being 
marginalized and, and neglected and it needs to, you know, to develop a kind of vitality. She said, and I, but my argument is that for South African book history to retain vitality and relevance, it must contribute to an intellectual culture of social critique without, within South Africa's public sphere. And in order to do so, it must address urgent questions in the political present by returning to the book historical dimensions of our contested past. So that I think, you know, in this respect, I entirely agree with um, the, the italicizing of history that we should return to history in all its texture. And I think, I, you know, I read, um, I read the commitment to a transnational awareness of book history's past as one possible way of thinking about nationalism in the present. Um, it's one way of critiquing or thinking about South African nationalism in the present. So what I want to do now for the rest of, of the paper is I want to demonstrate to you how I think we can draw together some kind of political critique of the post-independence nationalist present by thinking back and going back to early, earlier moments in our book, historic, our book historical past and draw lines between the two. And what I've chosen is the period of union and um, I'm going to go back to that but I want to start off by saying, and, and this is the question about um, the present that I, I want to foreground, I want to say how how has the printed word, if you like, contributed to the discursive constitution of South Africa? How has the book, how has the printed word helped to produce South Africa? Um, now the most influential uh, thesis explaining the emergence of the modern nation, and I'm just going to summarize this quickly for you because you'll all know it, is Benedict Anderson's formulation that the 18th century revolutions of the Creole pioneers in the Americas and then of the Jacobins in France provided templates for subsequent colonial and post-colonial nationalism. Anderson contends that once the French Revolution had occurred, it entered the accumulating memory of print. The experience was shaped by millions of printed words into a concept on the printed page and in due course into a model. In the same fashion, the American independence movement became, as soon as they were printed about concepts, models and indeed blueprints. And as a result, by the second decade of the 19th century, if not earlier, a model of the independent nation state had been constructed by a prince culture, including books, and was available for pirating. Extending Anderson's arguments to Africa, the proposition is that African nations, that's including South Africa, have pirated the French and US models of nationhood, imagining in the process their own national identities. And the generation of print and books has been pivotal to creating that nation. As in the Americas and France, so too in the case of African nations, the process of nation building is fundamentally dependent upon books and even more so upon more ephemeral forms of print culture like newspapers, pamphlets, posters, magazines. Okay, so does Anderson's model work for explaining the constitution of, post of the post-colonial African nations? To try and answer the question, I'm going to consider one particular case study, namely the imagining and then the writing and then the publishing and dissemination of print material that coincided with the constitution of the Union of South Africa in 1909. Applying Anderson's emphasis on the centrality of print capitalism in imagining political communities for this case study, the question becomes, how did the book and other forms of print contribute to constituting the Union in the aftermath of the South African War of 1899 to 1902? Or the question could be phrased in a more uncomfortable way, to what extent did the book in Africa and other forms of print facilitate the transition from inter-white civil war to white union and help to establish one of the 20th century's exemplary settler racist nation states. And then following from this a more difficult question, what continuities run from the Union of South Africa of 1910 to post-apartheid South Africa of 1994? More specifically, how has the book and print culture more broadly changed in the constituting and contesting of South African nationalism across those two moments in history? Okay, so in order, now going back to how to try and answer this question, in order to try and establish the extent to which the book helped to create the Union of South Africa, I followed in the first instance the very laborious route by simply counting how many publications between 1902 and 1909 contributed, even indirectly, to the process of nation building. So I used Francie Rousseau's Invaluable Guide to South African Printers and Publishers, 1795 to 1925, in conjunction with the most recent and revised edition of Sidney Mendelssohn's A South African Bibliography. 
Um, and I have assembled some preliminary statistical data. Um, and I've, I've assembled two, two sets of data. First of all, um, a diachronic axis. Um, historical access from 1902 to 1909, focusing on the oldest and biggest publisher in the period in terms of the number of publications, namely Jutas. And what I've done is I counted every single publication between that period and listed those that um, were in some way involved in creating the nation. So what we have, and here it is on the slide, there were 200, Jutas published 248 publications, only 22 of them were involved in, if you like, nation building. They were involved in nation building. And what I've written down there are some examples. Um, Alpha's The Englishman's Guide to the Speedy and Easy Acquirement of Cape Dutch. I mean, I think it's an amazing moment that, uh, you know, how you go from a civil war to a nation in seven or eight years. It's an incredible political feat, however ghastly its consequences were. And how, that, how they did that, I mean, I mean, I do think is really interesting. So there's, there, there are things like that where you want the Englishman to be able to talk to, you know, talk Cape Dutch so that, so that the, the white men, the two, the, the Dutch and the, the, the British can get on together so that they can cement their power. There are also, you know, novels like uh, from Watkins, From Farm to Forum. Um, there are reading books, uh, Yes Book for South Africa, which is, you know, um, political things uh, about the politics of the moment, the Blair, and the, the sorry, the David Blair Hook and the Maitland, and uh, the other one, Francis Wally's another novel. Um, just very really my own notes here that there's a proliferation of school set books and dictionaries, so that there's a new education system. You've got to get, you've got to, you've got to, if you like, um, a, there's a state ideology that has to be imposed on the schooling system as quickly as possible. So there's a lot of money to be made, presumably, in textbooks and dictionaries to that end. Um, you get a lot of novels written on, I'll come back to this later. The Watkins novel is, in fact, very left-wing. He's a socialist. The one, um, the last one by Wally, Mary Frances Wally, is incredibly racist and, and reactionary. So you get, they're all preoccupied with the union, but they're from very different political positions. They're political pamphlets promoting union. Um, so the sort of statute, large numbers of law books because the law is changing. But it's, it's, what is interesting, I suppose, to me, and I really didn't expect this, was actually how few they are. So when Anderson says, oh, it's all about printing and you know, creating a nation through words, the printed word, in fact, you look here over that nine years, Jutas doesn't suggest very many. Now, I also looked on a synchronic axis, I looked in the key year of 1909, and I looked at all the publishers in that year. I mean, again, asking how many you know, in this year of in intense kind of political debate as the union is being constructed, how many are actually, how many publications are there that write about, about the union and about nation? There are 183 publishers in South Africa in this period, 339 publications, and again, a very small number, only 40 on nation building. Um, just running down through them again, um, what is striking is a large number of political pamphlets uh, expressing widely divergent views. So Olive Schreiner, again on the left, and you get somebody like Imperialist, the, the bottom one, the writing on the wall, um, very pro-imperial, very uh, conservative. Um, many of the pamphlets that were published as, as pamphlets first appeared in newspaper columns and subsequently, so the Schreiner's closely union was originally uh, six articles in the Transvaal Leader. But again, the thing that struck me is that, you know, even in this febrile political atmosphere, only 40 of 339 publications are actually directly about nation building. Now, the second route um, that I tried to explore uh, to try and work out how these publications contributed to Union was to look at their content. What, what is in uh, these, these you know, relatively small number of publications over this period. And I looked at two categories of publications would have, which would have had a relatively wide readership, uh, certainly you know, amongst the white electorate. School history textbooks, firstly, and secondly, popular fiction. Um, so moving on to the history textbooks, um, between 1902 and 1910, there were seven different new textbooks that were published. Uh, those are five of them, as many as I could fit on one slide. Um, in all but one of them, Union was very zealously uh, promoted. 
So that, for example, in the first one I've listed there, um, Reverend Joseph Whiteside's school history, it opens with the epigraph, Late shall rise the people sane and great, forged in strong fires by equal wars made one. So that's a quote from Kipling. And immediately below it, uh, President Brandt, a quote says, Alle sal recht kommen, and President Kruger, Eendracht macht macht. This emphasis on union in, in the official languages. And the, the book ends with the words, Dutch and English sprung from one Teutonic stock, now form one. This is, a, this is the history textbook that kids will be reading in school after 1907. Uh, Dutch and English sprung from one Teutonic stock, now form one glorious Anglo-Dutch nation. As ex-President Stein said, if the war had done no more than make this possible, the suffering and loss of life had not been in vain. The misunderstanding and conflicts of the past, it is hoped, are ended, and their return made possible. Henceforth, there is to be one people, one parliament, one South Africa. Um, in another one, what you have in some of the others is a kind of slight unease about dealing too much with contemporary politics. The one I mentioned, the hope, the second one, um, actually stops in 1872. It's a bit nervous about bringing it too close to the present, but again has a strong master narrative of, of, of you know, forging union. The only textbook of those is the last one that was hostile to union. Um, it was uh, published, um, English and Afrikaans editions were both published in London. Um, and I haven't managed to get hold of a copy, but I found a very long review of it in the state which describes it in quite a lot of detail. And in this review in the state in 1910, it says, uh, you know, bemoans the anti-English sentiment and declares, in a book of this kind, intended for the instruction of the young, it is an almost sacred duty to avoid biasing the minds of the young on the subject of their own history. Controversial topics should be avoided, and anything which tends to stir the embers of racial hatred should, you know, should also be avoided. In all these points, the book before us errs most gravely, and we are afraid deliberately. The whole tone of the book is violently anti-English. What a deplorable start for the new nation to have its young minds impressed thus with a feeling of resentment and antipathy towards the whole British Empire, which they form a part. So this is the only book um, you know, and it really upset the state. The state was a magazine that was promoting union, and this particular uh, is a kind of, of, you know, a kind of Afrikaner separatist nationalist one that is is is, is trying to retain that. So, of all of them, that's the only one that strikes at a discord and chord. But for the rest, all these, as I said, all these history textbooks are very much about um, forging unity. Um, now, looking at literature, uh, there was popular, and looking at popular fiction, this is the second category where I tried to look at content to see how, many, how much fiction, how much literature was, look at, was trying to promote nation building. Um, in the period 1902 to 1909, there were over 60 novels published in English, 17 on nation building themes. Um, there's a list of them, uh, some of them, some of them and, and, and just some comments to make of them. Um, just to add, there were also 24 South African novels published in England during this period, and there were also many fictional works in Afrikaans on the South African War. Um, in, I haven't got the number for the period uh, just for 1902 to 1909, but this is, I think, very interesting. There was a 1972 MA thesis at Potchefstroom on Afrikaans novels on the war. And in 1983, when this published, the, the, the thesis was published, they counted 135 novels which is a huge amount of novels, all trying to cut, and, a lot, and, and, and um, in the same thesis, there was another thesis, they also discovered that, you know, by that stage there'd been 300 novels on the South African War. Now, obviously it's a very good story, the South African War, there's lots of, you know, lots of exciting fictions that can be generated about it, but an incredibly high percentage, and I obviously haven't read all of them, but pretty much all of the ones I've read are popular romances, and what, they, what happens in them is that you have, a, you have a British soldier, you have an Afrikaans farm girl, uh, they get married, there's all sorts of obstacles between their two separate nations, and then ultimately they get married and the farm workers carry on getting exploited as a colourful backdrop. And this gets recycled over and over again. Um, and it obviously has a powerful resonance, it's what people want to read about. And this kind of formula persists into the 20s and 30s. And there are very few, you know, there are very few exceptions, so Douglas Blackburn's Burger Quixote, is a, is a satire, and that's a bit different. Um, and some of the Afrikaans novels also are not as conciliatory. The, the, the one I did read was called Under the Future. Yeah, the Benful Jun one, I managed to get hold of and skim read that. And that ends, there's no happy reconciliation in that. But overwhelmingly, you can see there's ideological labor taking place. 
that is, if you like, interpolating the reader as, as a citizen of the new Union of South Africa. So yeah, uh, again just the final point, as in the case of the total number um, of military works, again, maybe, again, this is the last point to emphasize again, and it's coming back to it, that there were 60 novels in English overall published in South Africa. In the period 1900 to 1909, there are only 17 that do the nation building. I've kind of been getting slightly distracted by the number they were up to 1990. If we look at the period that I'm interested in, after the South African War to Union, as I said, there are only 17 out of the 60 plus. The rest are all sorts of other colonial romances that are not directly engaged. And I thought what I've... I've um, Archie and Beth have heard this terrible poem before, and I apologise to them, but I, just to give you the flavour of how, um, how Union gets uh, cast in literary form, here is one of these poems about nation-building, the, the uh, Lynn Lister's poem, which I, I, I mentioned before. Here the poem goes, Steep tower, the cliffs of Union, our toiling steps must climb. We plan in grave communion to scale these heights sublime. And though our eyes perceive no track, steal thou our hearts from turning back. So, you know, you're climbing a mountain together, the Union is the summit, and all these, you know, it's a, it's a huge heroic feat, and, you know, we will get there. Um, now, you might well say, and it's, it's certainly the case, that books are not the important place where this is going to take place. They're much more likely to take, you know, the, 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 the project of nature and building is going to take place in newspapers, and that's certainly is, the, is true. There's much more writing if you look at newspapers and magazines and more, uh, you know, daily kind of engagements in this that you do find much more. And both in the, you know, you have a very desegregated public sphere at that stage, so there's a white readership and there's a black readership, and not that much crossover. Um, I've been rereading Les Switzer's books on this, and they're extremely good at reminding you, to, you know, the, the, the kind of the, how, how um, absolute those divisions were. And in the white public sphere, most of the debates, and overwhelmingly, um, the black majority are routine. The phrase you see over and over again is the native problem. And union is presented as a means of solving that native problem. Um, <clears throat> the very rare exceptions to framing union in that are, are figures like Schreiner, who, and this is just a quote from an article of hers in the Transvaal Leader, very, very uncharacteristic of what you read. She says, We the whites desire the bond to a thirsty oxen in an arid plain desire water, or miners hunger for the sheen of gold. We want more and more of him to labor in our mines, to build our railways, to work in our fields, to perform our domestic labors, and to buy our goods. Um, but she's absolutely exceptional in warning that if the Bantu, as she says, is seen in this restricted way, if, bound to, uh, if unbound to us by gratitude and sympathy and alien to us in blood and color, we reduce this vast mass to the condition of a vast, seething, ignorant proletariat, then I would rather draw a veil over the future of this land. So she, she is rare in recognizing that union of the white races is a short-term and limited way of creating a national polity that can survive. Within the, within the black press, however, and this is, you know, there was unanimity, especially after the draft, South Africa Draft Act of 1909, there were quite strong divisions. A, a, a book has just come up, The Founders by Andre Odendahl, summarizes these very nicely in the last chapter. There were quite strong divisions of, and differences of opinion within the black leadership as to quite how to deal with union with particularly um, J.T. Dubavu, much more moderate, much more looking for ways of accommodation, and A.K. Sorga, uh, who had, a, who had a, you know, a, a kind of socialist rhetoric and was much, much more critical of the politics. But actually what happened after the draft South Africa Act of 1909, in those newspapers, what you read is unanimity. Uh, black intellectuals, black political leaders, very hostile to union and very clear of the betrayal that was being perpetrated by Britain and how the black franchise was being, you know, wasn't being extended from the Cape to the whole country, which was what black political leaders wanted, and also uh, black representation in Parliament no longer became possible. So you have John Dubé uh, on the 9th of April 1909, 
trying to be the voice of reasonableness. We see the NATO who's a civilized man is to produce it as nobody, then we think there is very good reason to say there can be no union without dishonor and quite um, ornate language. J.T. Jabago, as I say, the most conservative of the leaders, um, even him saying very, very bad policy indeed, may our beloved country be spared from it. And then the vituperative language, the, the very powerful polemic of Sorga, this is treachery, it is worse, it is successful portrayal for the actors virtually disenfranchised the black man already, even before the meeting of the Union and Parliament. This is a replica of the, you know, the betrayals of the Treaty of Ravenicum. Um, so the racial exclusions of the New Nations Constitution are immediately registered and protested in, in passionate terms. And the splits between the radicals like Sorga and moderates like Jabavu are transcended when confronted by the betrayal of Union. But the ultimate point is, is that the protest via the printed word was ineffectual uh, and Union, you know, obviously went ahead in 1910. So now, the, the, the question is, is, does taking seriously Anderson's idea of creating a nation in print resonate in the case of the Union of South Africa? The, the evidence presented here suggests that it does. You know, that there is, there is an amazing amount of uh, ideological labor, material, you know, labor into imagining and creating in the printed word um, a nation, and it kind of works, you know, because you do through all these books and newspaper articles, you do have, after, you know, and that's what happens. But how do we make sense of this? And, and, and this is where I want to introduce some very, and, and you know, and as book historians, that's what we want to do, that's what we want to read about. And we say, yeah, the book's really important, it's about, it has political agency through the printed word, through books, we have political change, and we have the construction of a political community. But I want to end off with and this, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a protracted series of qualifications. Um, and the first is that, you know, just um, is that swept along as fervent lovers of the printed word, and that's all of us in this room, there is the crucial question, how many members of the population at this point were literate, or more precisely, how many were included in the act of imagining and then scripting the new nation? Um, in the racist nomenclature of the 1911 census, the population of South Africa, the Union of South Africa, totaled 6 million, with 1.3 million whites, 4 million natives, 0.5 million coloreds, and 0.15 million Asiatics. Of those, how many were functionally literate, which is, means, by general definition, is four years formal education? Or more broadly, how many had the capacity to engage and participate in the discursive constitution of the Union of South Africa? As there was no centralized education system for black education before union, statistics relating to numbers of pupils and expenditure on black education are notoriously difficult to establish. But educational historians place the number at about 110,000, with a substantial majority of 75,000 in the Cape. In other words, 110,000 of 4 million black South Africans were in schools in 1910, acquiring the literacy skills that would enable them to read and write themselves into debates about nation building. This is from Ken Hartzorn's statistic. That's 0.3%. Extrapolating from these statistics to take into account the numbers of black South Africans already able to read and write in 1910, even the most generous projection would not go much above 10% of the black population. What this kind of statistic surely reinforces is the extent to which nation building in this particular colonial context is an overwhelmingly elite and white project. Okay, so I think that's important. Um, you know, Benedict Anderson is a, is a, is a left-wing theorist, and, I, and as I say, those of us who read him are often in sympathy with his politics, and also we love books. And the arguments are so powerful that I think we also often just forget to stop and think, hang on a bit, how many people were actually writing this nation into existence? Whether it was... France in 1789, America in 1776, or all the subsequent nations that were written into existence after that. I think it's easy to forget the extent to which these are elite projects and highly racialized if it's in a colonial context. So that's the first qualification. Now the second qualification, and this is something new for um, Beth and Archie, um, is it's also, I think I've, I've spoken about the content of these things that I've been reading, you know, of, of all these things that were published, but I think what's absolutely essential um, is that we can't from what is written down we can't um, simply assume that those who read the stuff understood it in the same way so I'm not saying this very well let me just read off what I've written the capacities of those reading printed matter to interpret the written word 
according to their own priorities must always be recognized. So you have to look at what actual readers understood when they read. Um, and I want to just give you an example. I was looking for a long, long time for examples of black South Africans who were reading between 1902 and 1909 to see how they interpreted these racist history books, how they interpreted, or if I could find one example. And I came across um, in the archives of Wits, it's something other people have written about, but I, you know, reading it, the manuscript there, really things leapt out at me, and that's the autobiography of um, uh, Victor Richard Salope Tema, 1886 to 1955, who was a student at Lovedale between 1906 and 1910, precisely in the years of Union. Um, and he's been written about Tema very well by Jane Starfield and Les Switzer, but his recollections of reading the kinds of Eurocentric history textbooks used in South African schools at the time of Union attest both to the agency of African readers and to the dangers of exaggerating the agency of the printed word in its own right in interpolating obedient colonized subjects. So I want to just show you two quotes from his autobiography to show you, you know, to emphasize that readers, actual historical readers, you know, you've got to take them seriously in their own right. I mean, I'm sure you will agree with this, but here's how he describes, and I think it's quite, quite a moving, it's a strange piece of writing this and really quite complex. Um, he says, truly speaking, books became my companions. And this naturally, he's talking about how he, this is actually just before he got to Lovedale, and then how it's, it's kind of runs from that through Lovedale and how important books were to him. He says, uh, books became my companions, and this naturally made me lose the friendship of other boys who were not as studious, studious as myself. I enjoy being alone. I like to walk alone, to talk to myself, and think of things that matter in this life. This habit of mine, a habit which makes some people think that I'm conceited, came to me through the love of books. Although I realize its iniquity, its destruction of friendships, yet I cannot regret having developed it, this love of books. The fellowship I find in books is more valuable, more inspiring than that which I find in association with persons. I do not think that I, what I would have enjoyed the friendship of Shakespeare as I enjoy that of his plays, which is Venice, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Comedy of Mirrors, nor that of Lord Macaulay as I enjoy his lays of ancient Rome. Books are not quarrelsome, they do not argue the point, they direct and guide. If you're in trouble, they do not tell tales about you, but they advise you to, and give you hope and courage. They extend a helping hand when you are in difficulties. So he attributes incredible, incredible centrality. Books become part of his identity. He defines himself as a person for whom books are more important than people. And he thinks of the arguments in the books as if they're more vivid than people. It's more vivid and more powerful. And he says, they do not laugh at you or treat you with contempt. Books have no color or race prejudices. I can take the rising tide of color uh, with me to the hills and there let it tell how its author feels about the question of color. But I cannot easily persuade Professor Stoddart to accompany me to the woods and there tell me his fears about the rising tide of the advancement of the color ra colored races. Okay, so there are a few comments just to draw out of that. I think, you know, I think it's a, you know, a really interesting and complicated piece of writing. The, the, you know, the first point, the centrality of books to his sense of identity. Um, his confidence as well, I think, is very striking in, in his own ability to engage with books on equal terms and his elevation of books above people. And what I also think is really interesting is um, I actually went and looked up the rising tide of color and I managed to get a free copy. Um, and it's an extraordinary, horrible, you know, it's an awful book. It's famous. I'd only heard of it because um, the, the obnoxious, um, what's his name, the character in The Great Gatsby, who Daisy, Daisy Buchanan and Tom Buchanan, the most obnoxious man in The Great Gatsby is a huge enthusiast of Stoddard. Um, and you get to know that he's a horrible character because he reads Stoddard and thinks Stoddard is the answer because he's this terrible eugenicist and racist who thinks about and you, that's your key in Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby. That's how, that's how I heard of him. But you read this book and it's a eugenicist kind of um, 400 page thing and it's quite curious to me that um, Temer reading this in, I don't know, he would have read it, it was published in 1920, so has the confidence to think that he can take on this eugenicist, racist thinker who's written a 400-page book, who's a Harvard graduate, a professor at Harvard, and that he can transcend, there's a, there's a, if you like, a rational public sphere somewhere, that he, with his anti-racist humanism, his Christian faith and his humanism, can defeat 
the eugenicist and racist. And so as I say, it's I think quite a quite an interesting confidence. And curiously, I mean, I found as well that W. E. B. Du Bois. It, it wasn't unusual that W. E. B. Du Bois in 1929 uh, took on Stoddart in a public debate in America. So that there's this belief that um, people like of that generation, like Du Bois and Temer, that racists can be educated out of their racism through rational argument. That's almost what Temer's faith is here, and that's what you can do through books and what books can offer you. But I want to look then at a second quote from his autobiography. Um, and this again is very typical of what he does, and I want to just pick up briefly. And this is his experience of reading history textbooks of South Africa, and how he read them, these ones I spoke about earlier. Um, he says, it's no injustice to those who wrote the history of South Africa in the early days to say that they wrote it with an object in view. Their primary object seems to have been to impress the world with the wickedness and cruelty of the African race and to enhance the prestige of the white race. The so-called Kaffir Wars, as already pointed out, were said to have been waged solely for the purpose of plundering lonely farmers, but an impartial inquirer would have discovered that although there was a great deal of plundering and pillaging, the wars were prompted by an ardent desire to rid the country of European invaders. There were similar wars to those waged by the Britons against the conquering Romans, Anglo-Saxons and Danes, or by the Anglo-Saxon tribes against the invading Romans. The motive that prompted these wars was not that of stock theft, but of self-preservation. It was not for the sake of the farmer's cattle and sheep that black men made that futile but noble attempt to drive the white man into the sea. It was not for the sake of mere plunder that the Amakosa people, in obedience to the false prophecy of a misguided girl burnt their corn and killed their cattle in the hope that the white man would be driven to sea. It was for something far greater, something nobler than all of this. It was for the independence of the African race, for its right to develop along its natural lines is to determine its destiny without less or hindrance. And so he goes on, and what he does, he actually has paragraphs on Chaka, and he says that's how he's represented in the history books, but in fact, quite the opposite. He was a heroic leader who should be compared to Napoleon. He looks at Moshwe and he says the same thing. You know, he's denigrated as a scoundrel and a, a you know, kind of operator, whereas in fact he was a brilliant strategist operating from a position of weakness. So he has read these history textbooks that we've talked about, that are these nation building, you know, union of the white races, denigration of the African. He's read them, but he's vigorously interpreted them according to his own politics and refused their racist logic. So he has a strong and clear understanding of the colonial ideology underlying the textbooks and he reverses them and his strategy he uses over and over again actually, which is very effective, I think, I mean it's very persuasive, as he says he keeps comparing the Europeans coming to South Africa to the Norman invasion of Britain. So that if you like the Normans or like the European invaders to South Africa, and the Anglo-Saxons who gets plund you know, get defeated and subordinated, or like black South Africans, and he keeps saying, "Yes, well, that happened to you, you know, that happened to you, and now it's happening to us." And you know, he's got this kind of rhetorical swagger and confidence, which is, as I think, rhetorically very powerful. Um, what what I think is also interesting about Temer, and I've got two final points which are drifting slightly into a different set of arguments, is how he's been written up uh, by previous generations of South African historians. Previous generations of South African historians going from Baruch Hurston to Peter Walsh to Simons and Simons to Tom Lodge um, have tended to treat Temer, which is what he was, as um, he was a moderate, he was a kind of conservative Christian nationalist. And they tend to be very critical of him for not being more radical, not being, being more of a kind of confrontational African nationalist. Jane Starfield, in a very good article, which is much more nuanced and much more interested in his, the form of his in, uh, autobiography, sums him up as the consensus of South African historians as seeing him as a half-loaf man. Because when it came to confrontation, uh, what Temer characteristically did was settled for half a loaf rather than no bread. Um, so he was a compromiser and he was also very, and this is important, he was, his, his stock strategy and the way he has been come down to us is that he would often write and say very radical things 
but when it came to confrontations, he would back down, compromise, and act in a much more moderate, conservative way. And what I'm interested in is, you know, we come back to this mono, you know, we come back to this unpublished autobiography, you know, 20, 30 years later after those South African historians last looked at him, and we're looking at him completely differently now. As I said, those of us in this room, we look at it as book historians. We're thinking about him as how the book forms his identity, but we also think of him. I suppose I do anyway, sorry, I shouldn't speak for everybody. But we're thinking critically about South Africa's post-colonial nationalism, you know, and what the new post-colonial nationalism is. And when you look at, um, when you look at him and you think about, you know, he, he gets very much dismissed as a moderate and a conservative in the heroic stage of history writing. Um, he's not a good enough radical, he doesn't fight racism, you know, in an uncompromising way. So he's, he's diminished. But I think that this pattern of radical talk and model, moderate political action actually does have you know, resonances in our present with the way Mbeki has functioned. Often incredibly radical political statements combined with conservative economic policies. Um, and that you could start to say that there's a pattern that happens in these early African readers, if we go back, you know, these African political leaders, where they were often setting up a kind of, pre, they were prefiguring ways in which African political leaders in a post-colonial context have to make, you know, embrace a radical rhetoric and espouse a radical rhetoric for, for a vast amount of their populace, but then often are forced by global political pressures, economic pressures, to settle for much more moderate, much more politically conservative, for, if you like, neoliberal economic policies. I mean, this is more controversial, but I, I think there's something to be said, and this is why I'm saying I think it's useful to try and connect, you know, book history and then also histories of stuff that happened like in 1910, with now to ask these kind of uncomfortable questions about our present and look for different lineages. Because, you know, if there's a lineage um, after, 19, you know, 2012, 1912, 2012, that was, was all done up last year, who are the people who are elevated and celebrated and who are those political leaders who were written out of that line of heroes? Somebody like Tema wasn't celebrated and remembered in any great vividness. But I think actually, as I say, I do think that his, 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 his autobiography is, is, is really, really rich and interesting. So anyway, that's, that's that. And, um, the main point though is to take our, these historically situated readers um, seriously. Now the third qualification, and I'm going to end very soon now because we've got, we'll have about half an hour for questions, um, is that the history of the book in Africa or the history of the book in South Africa of print culture, um, and this is again an obvious point I think, but just to say that it should never just be read in isolation but always in juxtaposition with histories of exploitation, histories of state violence and histories of resistance. Um, and, in, in, and in this case study, what is the relationship between the ideological labor represented in all of these publications between 1902 and 1909, what we might term the discursive constitution of the nation, and other historical forces and agents, collective and individual, that combined to produce the Union of South Africa? What I'm saying is, is that, okay, I've said up to now, what happens between 1902 and 1909? You go from civil war to union. And I've said all this writing and all this print culture is incredibly important in helping to make that happen. And my, this last point is saying that actually there were also other things that weren't written down that were important, that never got it, in, you know, never made it into print in any way, shape, or form. And these are just three things that we would say we have to factor in into understanding uh, the historical transition. One is simply uh, um, how the ruling elites made a deal, the deal making. Smuts himself attributed Britain's willingness to give their vanquished foes self government the humanity of Liberal Prime Minister Henry Campbell Bannerman. In Smuts's autobiography, he describes how in 1906 he visited Campbell Bannerman and simply spoke to him as man to man and appealed only to the human aspect, and how Campbell Bannerman then immediately reversed the imperial agenda of Rhodes and his ilk and offered self-government to the Union. Now that's self-aggrandizement on the part of Smuts, but again, if you want to understand history, I think you have to look, you have to take seriously what these political leaders were doing, making deals behind the scenes. Um, a second you know, explanation is that of economic exploitation. And historian Bernard Magabani argues that inter-white 
rivalry might have filled the daily newspapers, Dutch versus British, Boer versus British. And what he argues is that the Afrikaans-speaking minority played out a charade of parliamentary conflict with the English-speaking minority, masking the solid unity of class interests and intentions between those two white minorities that collaborate, collaborated in the exploitation of the black majority. So saying that, you know, um, and, and the fact of economic exploitation isn't necessarily going to be written down. Um, it doesn't take place, I mean, you might treat, I suppose, the contracts, the labor contracts, but for people who are illiterate and are being, you know, vast amounts of those relationships are not, are not part of a print culture or kind of a recorded record. And our access to them, you know, at this, at this distance is really, really difficult. And a, and a third reason as well is, um, you know, the, the, the importance of state violence for understanding history. So that historians Jeff Guy and Shula Marx, they emphasize the importance of the Mapumolo uprising, also known as the Bambata Rebellion of 1906-07, against the imposition of poll tax in Mattel, and in particular its brutal suppression, which saw 4,000 killed. Marx argues that the uprising hastened the unification movement, partly shaped the form of the unification took, and profoundly affected the nature, nature of white identity. So that, you know, the, the Bambata Rebellion was a kind of something that generated incredible fear in white South Africans at that time. And, you know, Marx argues is that was what, you know, made panic people into going for union and for a united front of Dutch and English against that. And again, these are all different things that, I mean, you, you know, we, we, we all want to do book history, but I think the, 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 the danger is, is if you leave out all of these things, you make claims about your little patch of history that are very hard to actually sustain. And it's, I've been, uh, you know, I remember the argument, I suppose, this is, this is a, maybe a good way to end, uh, to thinking about methodology. You know, when I, when I was, you know, learning how to, how to analyze literary texts, um, the first step was to say, you can't just read the text on itself, you've got to look at its historical context. And what, what, what happens next then is people can say, well, okay, if we look at its historical context, look at its book historical context, let's look at its book history, its publishing history, and that will be enough. And I suppose what I'm really saying, and this is the final point I'll try and end on now, that's not enough either. You have to go beyond the book historical context to a broader historical context that looks at all these things uh, about people who haven't got books, you know, who are excluded from the book, as well as those who have access and are included in a book-reading world. It's okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.